So continuing our lesson today, the previous lessons that we're looking at, we are discussing the public ministry or soul winning. And let's take our Bibles to the beginning verse of Proverbs chapter 11. The finer, greater place to start is with the Bible. And we'll talk about that today. But Proverbs 11 verse 30. We read that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that wins souls is wise. So we want to be wise. We want to be approved of God. We want the ability to earn crowns and inheritance in eternity. Uh, and the wisdom of God, one of them is to go out and try to win souls, public ministry, um, soul winning. And it's fruit. There's fruit. And that kind of fruit we've already discussed in previous lessons, you can get the video or the audio on YouTube or SoundCloud, is sometimes we don't see that fruit. You realize that I was saved come up April 21st, 1987. And if I could trace my roots of salvation, it can be traced to one of the 12 disciples and apostles of Jesus Christ. That man, one of those apostles witnessed to somebody, they witnessed to somebody, and it came all the way to me. There, Peter, James, John, Paul, all the disciples, their fruit is still going strong in 2018. And, and I wonder at that moment, the Bible says, when the angels rejoice in heaven at, a, at one lost man who has come to Christ as their Savior, is if they know at that point. My love for the Lord and, and public ministry of the Lord has fruit. Some of the fruit I know, some of the fruit I know by name and I'm praying for them. And some of the fruit I don't know, whether by missionaries that we support or somehow, some way, you know, just leaving a gospel track in a bathroom or leaving a gospel track anywhere. And someone's got saved by that. So today, we're going to look at some little rules, little things, little suggestions about the public witness and soul winning. And number eight is set a time. Set a date and a time to go. Schedule it. If you do not, you won't, and then nothing gets done. Set a date, and there's no excuse. There are things in, a, in a, with my family and myself. Doctors, funny, I just had things with my, my dentist. And what days are good for you? Fridays and Saturdays are out. Fridays, I got the flea market ministry, and Saturdays, I have the, the farmer's market. Now I got a new date Wednesday, hopefully to grow strong in that uh, Bible study lesson. Set it down in your appointment book, your calendar, whatever you do on this date, this time. Whether it is you and a friend or, or your church. On this particular day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On this date, 1, 2, all the way up to 31st. At this time, morning or afternoon, I am going to go out and I'm going to serve the Lord and do public witness. Soul win. Try to witness the people. Now, understandably, like, for the ministry we have, if it rains at the flea market, well, we got covering. If it rains at the farmer's market, well, you don't want to catch ammonia. If it rains that day, you can't do it. If it rains that day, maybe later on it'll clear up. Go then. But you've got to set a date. And don't let anything affect your appointed day of soul winning. 
Does anything affect your business meeting? Your birthday, your hair appointment? You ever make excuses for those? But why do you make an excuse for God? And there are going to be some people who are going to say, well, you know, we got this to do. Well, I can't do it. I'm, I'm serving the Lord that day at that time. Well, can't you? No. You got to say no. Which comes first, people or God? Which comes first, unsaved people going to hell? You might go do whatever you, you do outside of public ministry, and that person dies that God wanted you to meet with and talk with and ends up in hell. Or whether it be a Christian, that, that person that God wants you to meet up with, and they never grow, and they die, and they don't get anything. Now, souls, number nine, souls, not so winning. We cannot go with the aspect we're going to soul win. Because there's many times I've gone from public ministry that there has not been a soul won. And at the end of the day, and I say, wow, man, I did that for two hours and nobody got saved. And that is going to discourage you. And that is why I say public ministry over soul winning. Now, maybe that person got saved an hour after, a week after, a month after, a year after you talked with them. But majority of the time that you go out on that Pacific date to have a public ministry, 95% of the time, they're not going to get saved. And that's going to discourage you. You say, well, I know this church. They got 25 saved last week. Every time they do something, they get people saved. It's time to refresh this lesson. It's time for you to say, hey, next time Brother Haver comes out with, with the next lesson, I'm going to listen to. Because then you understand, are there really 25 people getting saved? This day and age? So, every human has a soul, and a soul is eternal. It will end up one day in heaven, or it will end up one day in hell. And we've already seen in previous lessons, you need to go back and listen. God sends preachers. God sends men. It is the duty of the Christians that are saved to go into all the world and preach the gospel. An angel can't do it. He's going to tell you, go get a man. Now, one thing I, I throw in this in here, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, this has come up, but it doesn't come up too rarely. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of beast that goeth downward to the earth? That's a spirit. Animals do not have souls. Animals do not need to be saved. Oh, go save the whales. Go save the manatees. Go save the crickets. When they die, they just go right back to the earth, right back to the ground where they came from. They are not in heaven. I know somebody, oh, my dog, I witnessed to my dog and it got saved, and you're a fool. We need not to spend time with animals, but human souls. Get off the distraction. There are people go out there will save a whale on a beach. Why aren't us Christians out there trying to save a soul from hell? Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. And there will be people, and they'll say something, well, can my dog get saved? My cat is saved, and... You can beat around the bush, you can prance around the mountain. Unless they're truly seeking God and got an open heart, you, you're not going to deal with people like that. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Humans are born to die. The wages of sin is death. Because of Adam and Eve, 
We are born into sin. We are sinners. And we will die. And when we set out, talk about any public ministry, we need to realize one fact and one fact only. People are going to die. And there could be a possibility if I put off, if I don't do, if I excuse myself. Somebody you would have had met. And I honestly believe that we have a set date by God when we're going to die. God knows. And God puts us in the way of people lost and saved that we may exhort and rebuke them that they may gain to knowledge of what God expects their life lost or saved now let me say for the saved person that we meet I'm saved and they have no idea what you're doing because their church does not teach their preachers have failed and I find that many a time in a public witness that people look at you and they have no idea, though it's in the Bible. And yet it is absent from the preacher's pulpit. And that is a time, not somebody who needs to be saved, but a Christian who is saved that needs to be taught and needs to be put on the formula, the milk, and to be grown and to be weaned by the word of God for, for you that they may grow and learn. When they die, they will have access to the ability of gaining crowns and rewards. Now, for a human soul, it's eternal life of the soul. It's heaven or it's hell. And there's nowhere else. Now, there are doctrines out there. There are teachers out there. There are churches out there. And there's a place of limbo. There's a place, you know, you just die and that's it. And you just rot in the, in the coffin or wherever they do with your body. And we've got to deal with those people. We've got to deal with religion. We've got to exhort and rebuke religion with the Bible. That man has eternal soul. Let's look at, I believe it's Luke 16. About that soul. Luke 16. In verse 23, uh, 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died, all have sinned, and was carried by the angels of Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died, all have sinned, and was buried. Now, religion st stopped there. Jehovah Witnesses stopped there. You just buried and that's it. But the Bible does not stop because that's a semicolon. Let's continue. Let's stop and pause and continue with the sentence. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Well, that's not his body because his body's in the grave. We read in Ecclesiastes, the spirit goes back to God. What is that third part of us, the soul that goes off into heaven or here it goes off into hell? And the soul that is in hell has eyes. Being in torments, the soul in hell is tormented. Seeing, the eyes see. Verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, he's got to have a tongue because he's talking. Have mercy on me. The soul wants mercy. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger. There's fingers. Lazarus has got fingers. He's got fingers. And cool my tongue. He's got a tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. There's a flame. 
The soul, whether it goes to heaven or it goes to God, has fingers, has tongue, have ears, have eyes, and they all still have their facility. And the major reason for to go in all the world and preach the gospel, whether you call it soul winning or you call it public ministry, that men are going to die and they're going to burn in hell unless they repent and get right with God. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? They're not going to get saved automatically. They're, they're not going to be elected to be saved automatically. They've got to hear from a preacher. And the only preacher is going to tell them the truth about salvation is one that has already been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. A Catholic will say, here, eat this biscuit and pray to Mary. A Jehovah Witness will say, here, go sell these magazines. A Mormon will do his Mormonism. A, a, a church will get you to join their membership. A religion will get you wet with baptism. A Christian will tell you about the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you from all sin. That the only way, the only way to have access to God the Father is through Jesus Christ and the merit of Jesus Christ. The gospel that Jesus Christ suffered and died, according to the scriptures, and was buried and arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Religion will lie to you. Religion will come up with other things. Now back to the soul of the man, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. You're not going, they're, they're not going to get this message on the radio. They're not going to get this message on a television set. They can get the message on the gospel track. They will get the message from a Christian that speaks his mouth. Man has the eternal soul, and when you die, that is not it. The Bible speaks about an afterlife. Afterlife is heaven or it's hell. And there will be religions that say, oh, you go to heaven if you do our thing. You go to heaven if you do this thing. And if you go to heaven, you're a good person. And you ask them, do you have assurance you will go to heaven? And they will answer you, no. Or I think so. Whereas I have the Bible to say, these things have I written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. You gotta get the religion out of them. But the eternal soul of man, John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the message. You're to carry to the lost world. God loves you that he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus Christ to suffer and die in your state because you cannot do anything to attain salvation. To it, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if Jesus is the way, religion's no way. The merit of Jesus Christ. Look what I've done. Look at my baptism. Look at what church I go to. Look at my pastor. Failed, crap, junk, garbage. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. We're not to go out there and uh, talk about uh, Republican and Democrats. We're not out there to talk about baseball team. We're not out there to talk about weather. We're talk about Jesus the only means that God has set forward for a soul to be saved. 
Religion is man-made. Jesus Christ is God approved. And notice here in John 3, 16, the love is past tense. L-O-V-E-D. That love of God for the sinner is at Calvary. And the moment a sinner walks away from Calvary, rejecting God, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, there is no more love. And we've got to explain that to these people because there are idiot pastors out there. God is love and just loves everybody. He hates the sinner. Oh, but he loves the sinner. That's a lie out of hell. I wonder what their John 3, 16 says. you got to explain to that man that his rejection of Jesus Christ will put him into hell. It will be, look at John 3, 36, same chapter. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. Colon. He that believeth not the Son, John 3, 16, believe, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. Luke chapter 16. That is hell. You need to tell that person in his soul that if he rejects Jesus Christ, there is no love but wrath. And what is the wrath? Hell. So, Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? Saved from what? The wrath of God. Saved from hell. How? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's a man's soul we're dealing with. Everything in this world is temporal. That's a man's soul. Number 10. Number 10. We have clean, being clean, cleanness. Wash your body and smell good. Do not offense the person you're dealing with with your bodily offense. Don't offend people by your smells and on the other hand you know take a bath wash yourself don't stink don't offend yourself with cologne or perfume that they can't breathe there are some women that they wear i swear they, they jump in the bathtub with that stuff they put on and pee you you stink put enough on that it covers your body smells and put enough on that it don't overpower Wash your clothes. Don't go out with spotted clothes and wrinkly clothes and be professional. Non-advertising clothing. Don't go out with Coca-Cola shirt. Don't go out with, you know, just do it or, you know, sneakers or anything like that. And I'm going to tell you what I, I was first saved. And it took me a while and no one ever told me. I was a smoker. I was going out witnessing with cigarette shirts on. Cigarette advertising. I can imagine what the lost people were thinking. I don't think I probably got a lot of results with those shirts. And I would stay away from shirts that advertise your church or your pastor. See, when you're going out so winning, it's not for your church. It's not for your pastor. It's for Jesus. All right, wear a shirt that says Jesus saves. Wear a shirt that has scripture. That's okay. But uh, Mile High Baptist Church or Great Joseph Smith Preacher, www.weloveourpastor.com. No. I try to avoid at all tense of what church I'm at or church I attend when I'm dealing with people in their souls. Now, what church you go to? Well, I go to this church and I get right back to their soul about God and Jesus. A church is not going to save you. A membership in church is not going to save you. A baptism of a church is not going to save you. Being baptized by a church is not going to save you. The pastor of that church ain't going to save you. Wear a nice shirt. And again, it's a scripture shirt with King James scripture. Uh, how to be saved? Okay. I wouldn't wear a shirt that, you know, abortion or, and, you know, we're not there for those issues. We're there about the soul. 
So non-advertising clothing, fresh breath. You are going to be having your breath in front of that guy with going into his nose and don't let your breakfast interfere with your, your witness of God. Don't let, if you got bad breath, I mean, if it's normal, it's uh, carry some certs or some uh, breath spray. Because there's nothing more that Satan will say. You'll be there for God so loved the world and Satan be saying, you smell that breath? Really? That guy, you'll be saying for the wages of sin is death and he's looking at your t-shirt. He doesn't believe in your t-shirt. And if you're a woman, you got advertising in your shirt. Now you attracted his eyes, not only to the advertisement, but, you know, advertisers know where to put their name on. So you don't want the guy to be distracted by your clothing. You don't want the guy to be distracted by your smell. You want him to be into the word of God. And you must be respectable then rather than offensive. Now, the scriptures in the Bible is going to be offensive, but let not you, what you're doing, how you're doing, what you're wearing, what you smell, let that not be the offense. Now, if you go to a scripture part and says, call no man your father, and you're dealing with a Roman Catholic, well, that's what the scripture says. If you're dealing with somebody and they say, well, you know, but there is no hell and you open the Bible, the, the Bible book, Bible chapter, Bible scripture, and you say there is a hell, well, that's offensive to them, but that's the scripture. But when that guy can tell you what you had for lunch on your shirt, you're in trouble. There's been many times talking with somebody and something about that person something that person is doing so has distracted and I know me I, it, good subject good talking but and that moment do you you realize because we're going to talk about uh, in point number 12 I don't know about today go two by two have you realized that guy is turning his face away from him because you got bad breath or old let the second person step in. You don't want the gospel to be offensive. And back off. Repent to the Lord. Oh, Lord God, I'm sorry. And let the other person. We want to do it right. We're dealing with people's souls. And when we're dealing with people's souls, people will look to any excuse to get out of not listening to God. Number 11, a Bible. You will definitely need a New Testament, small, readable print. Now, don't have such a Bible that, you know, that an aunt will say, hey. And then you don't want to carry your family Bible. You know, that big family Bible with all the names and all the stuff. You don't, you don't want to go from very small to gigantic. You want a handheld, at least New Testament, small, readable print Bible. If you can get one such a size, and a good size, I like that one here. Yeah, we both got stuff here, but let me show you. This Bible, oops, make a mess. This Bible here, it's, it's small. It's got New and Old Testament. Okay. About that size. Print. Kind of small, though. The larger the print, the smaller the Bible would be best. And that would be definitely the New Testament Bible. Because you don't, you don't know what the eyesight of the people you're going to deal with, and you don't want to have somebody who can't read. You want scripture. Whoa, look how big that is. So again... The biggest print you can get, but the smallest Bible you can get it in. And you gotta be very careful when you're dealing with online catalog, because I have purchased giant print Bibles. And when I got it, it's like giant to who? The insect world? Because that's not big. 
I would go to a bookstore and find a King James Bible and look at it and see the print. Now, if you can get a good size print, both New and Old Testament, that's fine. But most likely you're going to find it in the New Testament. Now, one that is not marked. If you take your, your, your study Bible, it's marked and colored, like if I were to take mine. You're going to be saying, well, here, look, see, for God so loved the world, then it, well, what's that over there? Well, that's, that's not part of the lesson. Why did you color that in? What's that note? And now you've taken their attention off the Bible with your Bible. Clean, unmarked by Now, there is a way you can, you can mark the Bible by Romans Road. And, you know, there's like, if there is a scripture reference or note somewhere, somewhere in the Bible, you can do it with a very faint but, uh, pe pencil to mark. All right, go to this next scripture. But have it so they don't notice it. You, you got to be careful because, again, they're looking for excuse and they can see, well, you wrote over here. Well, what's that? No. Why'd you highlight that? You got to keep them on the straight course of what you're trying to. It's like, you know, like we spoke about before, you're witnesses to somebody. Well, how do they get the animals on the ark? Well, we'll talk about that later. We got time. Let's get back to your soul. And it's the same thing. Well, what's that there? You got that whole thing outlined and colored in. Wow, what's that all about? And that may have nothing to do with witnessing that may do with tribulation that might do with the 12 tribes of israel that might do with anything but witnessing and it's taking their eyes off like i said do not carry one of them larger big family bibles make it simple easy to read bible and like i said if you if you got the romans road marked in there in, in pencil and he sees well what's that next verse you got there well, that's going to probably be the next phrase in the Romans Road. Some people do that. I don't. But you say, okay, let's look at this verse. Because that's the next verse we're going to look at. It's, really? Yeah. And you may get their attention to that verse you're doing that now. Okay, let's get to the next one. So with the Bible, keep it simple. Keep it readable. Keep it unmarked. And keep it. And like I said, we don't want distractions. We don't want than to go somewhere else. We don't want them at the end of our conversation about Jesus to say, well, he stunk. Oh, you see how bad his Bible is? I don't know how you could read that Bible. Well, that Bible is just so small or, you know. So. And we'll go one more 12. Going out two by two. Matthew 11, two. Now, I'm going to tell you stories that I know of personally. I know churches are so dead today. Listen to me. And I know men that love the Lord, do right, and have gone out alone. It is not advisable. Now, if the only way you can do it is go alone... I would go out and put gospel tracks on doorknobs only. I would not knock at the doors. You know, if you take chick tracks and put a rubber band right in through the center of it, you got, you got the rubber band, you can hang it on the door track. Never, ever have anything to do with tracks on the mailboxes. Never, ever. That's federal government property, and you will, and your church will get in trouble if you do mailboxes. But if there is no one else in your church and you are the only one that can agree to go out with a public ministry, be very, very careful. Maybe we'll look at a story in the Bible. But Matthew 11, 2. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Mark 6, 7. That's John the Baptist. Mark 6, verse 7. 
two by two. And he called unto him the, tw the twelve and began to send them forth two by two. John the Baptist and Jesus sent them out by twelve, by two. You find Paul would be in a company of others with him. Peter and John, Acts chapter 3, are out together. You've got to have someone there to back you up. You've got to have a witness. The Bible says out of two, out of the mouth for two or three shall be established, shall be a witness. You're going out there in a, in a gross, perverted world where there are lawyers on billboards, lawyers on TVs, lawyers on cars, lawyers everywhere. If you've been sued, if you've been in an accident, you had this happen to you, call us idiots and we'll get you more money that will go in our pockets. And it'll be nothing more for someone to say to a lawyer, I had this guy come to my house and he assaulted me. And if you got no one else there to back you up as a witness, let's see if I can find this in Genesis. Joseph is a remarkable example. And Joseph chapter 39. And 39. Mm. Oh, we can just read the whole thing for the sake of time. Verse 6. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. Joseph was a very remarkable, honest man, character. And he knew not what he had saved the bread which he did eat and joseph was a goodly person and well favored that's god speaking that's pontifar speaking the character of joseph and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon joseph and said lie with me but he refused and said unto his master's wife behold my master wrought not what is in my, what is in his house so here Potiphar's wife has his has her eyes on Joseph. Verse 10, it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none other. There was none other, none of the men of the house therein. Joseph is alone with his woman. And you go knocking on doors and you go into that door and there's no one else but the woman and you. And when it comes to pass that she tells everyone that Joseph has tried to rape her and it's a lie. And Joseph has no witnesses. And Joseph is honest. Joseph is right. He's done everything by God. He has been without witness and ends up in jail and the holy spirit records he he's godly he's wonderful it was all her fault but with no witness at that moment when he realizes it's just him and her in that house it's time to leave joseph and i had a preacher tell me in in, in one of my classes studying for the ministry as a pastor of the church, he would. If he realized he saw in the parking lot, he had his windows of his office by the parking lot, and you see a woman come in with her car and park her car, and there's just a woman, it's not his wife, anybody else, he would go out the back door, get in his car, he'd go down, get a grinder, get a Big Mac, get fries, get something at the store he needed. He would leave that church. That woman to do whatever her business is at that church, he would not give an opportunity for them to be alone. And he would not give opportunity for the neighbors to speak, say, oh, there's a pastor's car right there. And there's Miss such and such car. Oh, I wonder what they're doing. And the neighbors to see you go walk into a woman's house or a guy's house or whatever and say, oh, I wonder what's going on there. You need to go by twos. You need to have a witness to the activities that's going on. Again, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three. One converses, one talks. The other finds scripture and prays a lot. 
Now, as two, one and one together, too, it's not this person talking, this person talking over the other person while that person's trying to talk, and this person's over talking, this person's talking, and no, no. You've got to agree with each other. Before you push that doorbell, knock on that door, who's going to do the talking? Now, what the other person does is he tries to find the scriptures. For the person talking, he'll hand the Bible and say, here, it's right here. Or he'll be opening up his Bible and showing the person. Here's, here he is right there. Or that person, as I've done many times, you're standing there and you're praying. You're praying all the prayers you can get for that heart, for the person talking, for the Bible. And the second person is to take over distractions. Now we're not talking about distractions of your shirt or your clothes or your bad breath. We're talking about distractions of if the TV sets on, block it. Don't go over, turn it off. This, if you're not the one doing the talking, go over and stand in front of it. If there are children in the room, now everything you're going to do with children, make sure you do in that room with that parent or grandparent, whoever it is right there, in, in the eyes of that person. If there are children there and they're causing distraction, find a, a children's book, sit down with them and read. I don't care what book it is. Just read to the children in front of everybody the picture book. Calm them down, quiet it down so that the word can be taught. Now again, if the TV is really overpowering and it's loud and you can see this distraction, you, the other person, say, can we please turn it down? Turn it down. Don't say turn off. And then they'll say, okay, you can turn it off. Then do it. You, you've been given permission. You've done it rightly. You're the black distractions. Now the phone rings. I would not go over and ring it. I would pick it up. Just let it ring. I would try to get in the way of the ringer. I mean, you can block yourself from certain sounds. I've done that. You know, back in time, we used to have the phones on the wall or on the table. And you could stand between the phone and the person, and you mute out a little bit. There are distractions. They're not going to look at the phone as it's ringing. And then when you go two by two, if you're not the one talking, be quiet. Let the other person talk. And the other person comes, you know, they seem to be stalled or searching for something, then step in. Pray about it. Pray before your mouth. Again, when you go by two by two by two, it's to be unity, not mutiny. You're not there to cause fights. That's why it's not to be, you know, you're going in doctrinal statements and all that kind of stuff. It's not what you're there to do. You're, you're for the witness of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You ought to be in, in unity with the person you're with witnessing that, hey, we're just talking about how to get saved. Now, you got somebody there and you're trying to witness to them about hell and they don't believe in hell and they're stepping in. They, oh, you don't go with them no more. Now, I've never heard of that, but I guarantee it probably has happened. For, for the sake of your own testimony, for the sake of your character, for the sake for health, for the sake that John the Baptist and Jesus set out the standard two by two. And again, when you're going by two by two, it's great to be a husband and wife team. And you can have three, you can have a child go with you, a third person. Sometimes you end up with an odd person, very rarely, on a uh, you know, soul winning day, going out witnessing, door knocking, you'll end up with one odd person, don't send them home, send them with, with another group. But hopefully this lesson here today, we talk about uh, the soul, the, the soul of man, the cleanliness of the person and the Bible and going by two by two, we're not being offensive. We're not going to be a distraction, but we're going to be a help through the Holy Spirit. We've got to keep our vessels clean. We've got to keep our sins under the blood of Jesus Christ. If, he, if we are faithful and just, I'm, boy, I mean, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Before we go, while we're going, we are to confess our sins. We are to get our vessels clean so God can use us as clean vessels 
and that includes our bodies. 